to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ in Acts 16, verse 30 and 31, the greatest question that's ever been asked comes, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Today we're going to discuss the most solemn and important question ever asked, and we hope you'll get your Bible and stay tuned as we're going to study, What must I do to be saved together? That question, what must I do to be saved is a question that each person who wants to live with God must answer according to the Bible. And so today we want to begin by asking you, are you saved? Have you done what God says to be a Christian? If you answer yes to the question, you are saved, then we would ask, how were you saved? What did you do by which you knew you were saved? Maybe you were at a revival. Maybe you were at a youth camp. Maybe you were seeing something on the, heard something on radio or saw it on TV. How were you saved? And then more specifically, at what point in your conversion experience were you saved? This might tell you to say the Lord's Prayer and you knew you were saved. This might tell you to lay your hand on the TV or the radio and, or say the sinner's prayer and you'd be saved. And then we would ask, have you been baptized? Why? Were you baptized? Were you baptized for a specific reason? And when you were baptized, did you have water sprinkled on you? Was a little poured on you? Or were you immersed? All we're asking you from the outset of this lesson is to think about your own conversion experience. Make it clear in your mind exactly where you were, how old you are, what you did when you uh, obeyed the gospel. And then today all we're going to ask is, would you compare that, what you did, with what the Scripture says. And if the two match up, then friend, that's wonderful. But if they don't, we would encourage you today to make changes where necessary. Let's begin by talking about the need for salvation. Salvation is so important because of man's condition in sin. Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2, the Bible says, The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, His ear is not heavy that He cannot hear, but your sins and your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you that He will not hear. Friend, according to that verse, what is it that separates man from God? Your sins, my sins, have separated me from my God. And so sin is the great divide between God and man. Now, we know what sin is. For 1 John 3 verse 4 says, sin is a transgression of God's law. The Bible teaches us in James 1 verses 14 and 15 that sin comes from our own desires and lust. It's not as though I'm born with it. Rather, sin springs up within us when we have desires and lust and passion that we give into. And James says in James 4 verse 17, To him that knows to do good and does it not, to him it is a sin. And so sin's unrighteousness or transgression of the law. Sin is a failure to do what we know we ought to do when we give in to our passion and lust. But friend, let's ask this question. How many have sinned and how many need to obey the gospel? Romans answers that question in two verses in Romans chapter 3. In Romans 3 verse 10, the Word of God says, For there is none righteous, no, not one. How many are righteous? None, not even one. Romans 3.23 comments further on that idea. When the Word of God says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many have sinned? All. Does that include you? And does that include me? If all have sinned, then I have sinned. None righteous, all have sinned. Friend, do you see why there's such a great need to answer this question according to the Bible? And, and maybe to illustrate that further, we might show just how terrible the consequences for sin are. For example, in the sixth chapter of the book of Romans, verse number 23, 
the Bible says, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the wages of sin? Spiritual death, being separated from God forever. Now, how many sins do you have to commit to be separated from God eternally? One sin. God is a pure eyes than to behold evil. He cannot look upon wickedness. Sin separates man from God. Its wages is eternal death. In 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, sodomites, homosexuals, covetous, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Friend, will people living in sin go to heaven? Sadly, they will not go to heaven. In fact, Matthew 13, verses 40 through 42, there is a great separation. And at the end of the world, sinners will be cast into the lake of fire and torment. And so the consequences are spiritual death. The consequences are they will not be a part of God's kingdom and they will suffer eternally because of what they've done and how they live that's according to the plan, not according to the plan of Almighty God. And so let's turn it based on that fact that everybody sinned, that sin leads to horrible tragedy and an eternity with the devil. Let's turn our attention to that great question. What must a person do to be saved? And friend, as we think about this question, we're going to let the Bible give us the answer. And as we mention these steps in the plan of salvation, we want you to see it from the Bible. And each one of these verses is going to tell us this is a command we must do. And so what's God's condition for salvation? First, you must believe Jesus is God's Son. Here's the condition. John 3, 16, the Bible says, God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The condition stated in that verse is believe. Must a person believe in Jesus Christ to be saved? Absolutely, there is no denying that's the case. Now, can you be saved without believing? Not according to Jesus. In John 8, verse 24, Jesus said, Unless you believe that I am He, you will surely die in your sins. If you don't believe in Jesus, Jesus said, Unless. There's no way you can be saved unless you believe in Me. And so no denying a person must believe Jesus is the Son of God. But does salvation end at the point of belief? Is there anything else the Bible says a person must do to be saved? Well, there absolutely is. In fact, in Acts chapter 17, verse number 30, the Bible says, Truly, Paul speaking to the idolaters at Mars Hill says, Truly, these times of ignorance God once winked at or overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. What's the condition stated in Acts 17 verse 30? God now commands all men everywhere to repent. Now, when we talk about repentance, sometimes that's confusing to people, and sometimes people equate repentance with crying or tears, and while that may be involved, that's not all there is to repentance. In fact, 2 Corinthians 7, verses 9 through 10 says, Godly sorrow produces repentance. Now, is merely being sorry for your sins true repentance? No, godly sorrow produces repentance. When I'm sorry, that leads one to repent, and thus Repentance demands that the sinner turn from his ways. Now, is it essential that I repent to be saved? Listen to Jesus' words in Luke 13, verse 3. Certain people had come to Jesus and they said, Lord, what about these people who had their blood mingle with their sacrifice? What about these 18 people who are walking down the road and a tower falls on them and kills them? Were they were sinners than everybody else. And in Luke 13, 3 and verse 5, Jesus said, I tell you no, but here's that word again, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Unless you believe that I'm He, you'll not be saved. John 8, 24, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Must a person repent to be saved? Can you be saved without repenting? Jesus said, unless you repent, you'll all likewise perish. Now, a third step in God's plan of salvation, once I believe and once I'm willing to repent, I must confess Jesus as the Son of God. In Romans 10 verse 10, the Bible says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth 
confession is made unto salvation. What's the condition stated in Romans 10 verse 10? With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. I've got to do like the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8 verses 36 through 38 when Philip asked him, do you believe Jesus Christ? I believe with all my heart Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Here's water, what hinders me? If you believe, I believe. Jesus, he confessed Jesus as the Son of God. Now, like with these other two steps in the plan of salvation, let's ask, is that essential? Do I really have to do that to be saved? Listen to Jesus' words in Matthew 10, verse 32 and 33. Jesus said, If you won't confess me before men, neither will I confess you before my Father who is in heaven. But if you will confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Friend, did Jesus say you could be saved? if you do not confess Him. You won't confess me, Jesus said, neither will I confess you before the Father who is in heaven. And so we believe in Jesus as the Son of God. That's essential. We repent. That's essential. We confess Christ. Jesus said without it, there's no confessing you before the Father. It's essential also. And then, friend, the Bible also teaches that a person must be baptized to be saved. Now, I know a lot of people have trouble with the idea of baptism, but all we want to do is show you this is a command of God and that Jesus said you cannot be saved without being baptized first. Now, let's look to the Bible. Here's what we're asking you. Just look to the Bible with us and see if this isn't what the Word of God says. I direct your attention to 1 Peter chapter 3, and I'd like for you to look with me in verse number 21. Look in your own copy of the Bible. We're on the screen with us in 1 Peter chapter 3. I want you to notice what God's Word says in verse number 21. The Bible says, There is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now what's the condition stated in 1 Peter 3, 21? Peter said, Baptism does now also save us. The condition stated is baptism. And friend, don't miss those words. If the Bible says baptism now saves us, why would anyone dare say baptism is not essential to salvation? Now, let's talk about the essentiality. With every other point we've shown, you can't be saved, Jesus said, if you don't do these things. What about with baptism? Did Jesus say you can't be saved without being baptized? Notice John chapter 3, verse number 5. Jesus said, Verily, verily, most assuredly I say to you, unless, there's that word again, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Friend, did Jesus say you'll be saved if you're not baptized? Jesus said, unless one is born of water and the Spirit. He can't get into the kingdom of God. Now again, we realize there are a lot of people who teach things that are contrary to this. All we're asking you to do is trust your Bible. Look to the Bible. If that's what it says, then simply believe it and do what God's Word says. Now let me show you some other passages that clearly teach baptism is essential to salvation. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 16. And let's notice together verse number 16. That's Mark chapter 16, verse number 16. Jesus here said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Now, there are two conditions, and I want you to notice what those are with me. Jesus said we must, be, we must believe and be baptized to be saved. Did Jesus say, you're, you believe and are baptized, then you're saved? You bet He did. Did Jesus say both conditions are necessary to be saved? He absolutely did. Why would anyone deny the clarity with which Jesus spoke here? He that believes and the conjoining word and is baptized will be saved. Those are conditions Jesus set for salvation. Now, again, those are not the only passages. There's a host of other passages. Let me illustrate. If you're following along in your Bible, notice Acts chapter 2, 
verse number 38. Here Peter is preaching the very first gospel sermon. The men and women in Jerusalem realize they've killed their own Messiah. They now want to know, men and brethren, what shall we do? What can we do to, to get over to be saved from the sin of killing our own Savior? Peter responded by saying, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, don't miss this, for the remission of sins. The inspired preacher Peter told these believers to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, going all the way back to the beginning of our lesson, remember it's sin that separates us from God, right? Isaiah 59 verses 1 and 2. Whenever sin is removed, that's when a man's back in a relationship with God. Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Think about it maybe this way with me. In Ephesians 1 verse 3, the Bible says, All spiritual blessings are ours, the Christians, in Christ Jesus. Now, do Christians have every spiritual blessing in Christ? They absolutely do. If it's the case that all spiritual blessings are in Christ, are there any outside of Christ? Well, no, they're all in Christ. Uh, 2 Timothy 2 verse 10, salvation is in Christ. Is it the case that to be saved, I've got to be in Christ? Well, yeah, that's clearly what the Bible says. Must one be in Christ to be saved? Absolutely. Well, friend, here's the question we've got to ask then. Imagine that we have a circle here that represents being in Christ. Inside that circle are all spiritual blessings. Inside that circle is salvation. And man is outside of it. How does one get in Christ where salvation and all spiritual blessings are? Let's notice from the Word of God. The passage is Galatians chapter 3, verse number 27. The Word of God reads, For as many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. Remember, all spiritual blessings are in Christ and salvation's in Christ. How does the Bible say you get in Christ? As many of us as were baptized into Christ. The only way the Bible says you get into Christ is by being baptized. Ephesians 4 verse 5 makes it emphatic that there is only one baptism. The Bible says there's one body, one spirit, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one hope, one God, and Father of you all. Is there more than just one valid baptism in God's will today? No, nope, just one baptism. Friend, since it's the case that God only accepts one baptism, must we be careful that we're baptized the way God tells us to? Absolutely. The Ethiopian eunuch was baptized in water. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 through 38. Both Philip and the eunuch got down out of the chariot. They both went down into the water. He baptized him, and they came up out of the water. Did Philip baptize the eunuch in water? You bet he did. Did both Philip and the eunuch both go down into the water? Absolutely. Would it have been necessary? Now you think about this. Would it have been necessary for both Philip and the eunuch to go down, get out of the chariot, go in the water, and baptize him as sprinkling or pouring were acceptable? Would it have been necessary for them both to get in the water? Of course not. Think about these passages. In John 3, verse 23, John was baptizing in Anon near Salim because there was much water there. How much water does it take to sprinkle a baby or pour a little water on a baby? Not much. How much water does it take to immerse an individual? Much water. Think about this example. Mark chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, at Jesus' baptism, the Bible says, and coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. To come up out of water, Jesus had to first go down into it. Jesus was immersed. But you know the clearest picture of all is that of Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. I want you to listen to these words with me. As Paul speaks about both the importance and illustrates the mode of baptism, this is one of the clearest passages to help us understand that. Listen to Romans 6. We'll begin reading about verse number 3. Paul says, Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we've been united together in the likeness of His death, 
certainly also we shall be in the likeness of His resurrection. Now, friend, does the Bible here describe baptism as a burial in water? It absolutely does. Where do we get, when do we contact the benefits of the death of Christ? When we are buried with Him in baptism. Friend, if you're baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? Well, how could you if the Bible says that? If you're not baptized the way the Bible says, could you be wrong? Well, absolutely. If, if one's been sprinkled or had water poured on them and you don't find that in the Bible, could that be wrong? Absolutely. I, is it really something you want to take a chance on missing heaven over? And so we ask you to consider, do you be, really believe Jesus is the Son of God? As we've seen, Jesus commands repentance. Are you willing to start making changes in your life that Jesus commands and to live for God every day? Would you be willing to confess the name of Jesus before me? Have you been immersed in water for the remission of your sins? If you were taught you had remission of sins before baptism, could you really have been baptized for the remission of your sins? Now listen carefully, friend. A lot of people are taught baptism is not essential. A lot of people are taught that you're saved and baptized two weeks later. Could you have been taught wrong and somehow baptized right? Remember, you've got to know the truth. First, then the truth makes you free. If you were taught on error on baptism, how could you be baptized correctly and been set free from your sins? Those two ideas are diametrically opposed. In fact, if you were taught you were saved before baptism, could you have really been saved and baptized the correct way? And thus, since God describes one baptism as a barrel in water, could you have been scripturally baptized if you were sprinkled or if you had a little water poured on you? Friend, clearly one can see from the Scriptures that these things are indeed essential and that I must understand those to be right in the sight of God. And so we offer today some motivations, hopefully to encourage one to really obey the simple plan of salvation and just become a New Testament Christian. Here's the first motivation. Do you really love Jesus? In John 14, 15, Jesus said, If you love me, Keep my commandments. If we really love Jesus, will we want to obey Him? You absolutely will. Do you love Jesus? Are you willing to obey Him? Since Jesus wants you to obey the gospel and be baptized, and, and you understand the importance of being baptized, wouldn't it please Jesus for you to be baptized and obey the gospel? Do you wear the name of Christ only? That's what the Bible commands, Christians and Christians only. Does the church you attend worship the way that we've seen in the Bible today? Is the church you attend organized according to the pattern of elders and deacons and all Christians standing on level ground at the foot of the cross? And does the church you attend teach the simple plan of salvation? In Ephesians 5 verse 23, the Bible says that Jesus is the Savior of the body. What is Jesus going to save the body? He's going to save the body, which is the church. Friend, if I'm not in His church, if I'm not a member of the church you read about in the Bible, the church that Jesus died for, is Jesus on the final day going to save that church? And so we need to make sure that we're a part of the church that the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died for and that, there, that we're right in His sight. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 15, the Bible says that God opened up books. And one of those books is the book of life. And Christians have their name written in the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Anyone's name not found written in the book of life, He was cast into the lake of eternal fire and torment. Friend, it's essential that our name be written in the book of life. And so today we're asking you, is your name written in God's book of life? Do you want God to write your name in His book? If so, you've got to obey the gospel plan of salvation. What do you have to do to get your name in God's book of life? You've got to obey the gospel and become a Christian. If you recognize and have heard the Word of God as the final authority, 
Would you not believe in Jesus so that you can be saved? Would you not be willing to repent of your sins and turn from sin and turn to God? Would you confess the name of Jesus as the Savior of the world? And would you do what the Bible says when Jesus said, He that believes and is baptized will be saved? Friend, that's essential to salvation. And so we're begging you today, just simply become a Christian, nothing more, nothing less. Obey God's plan of salvation, and then you can know that you're right with God, your name's written in His book, and ultimately, one day, you can live with God in heaven for all eternity. We hope and pray that you'll do that without delay. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials as well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at 1-855-458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788, McMinnville, Tennessee, 37111. This is the Gospel of Christ.